This podcast is brought to you by HEC Paris. I am deeply honored and I thank the community of HSC for inviting me to enjoy in the 25th anniversary celebration of its permanent faculty. The core function of finance is to facilitate the allocation and deployment of economic resources, both spatially and across time, in an uncertain environment. The twin analytical pillars that support finance as an intellectual discipline are valuation and the management of risk. Time and uncertainty are the central elements that influence financial behavior. The complexity of their interaction brings intrinsic excitement to the study of finance, as it often requires sophisticated analytical tools to capture the effects of this interaction. Indeed, the mathematical models of modern finance contain some of the most beautiful applications of probability and optimization theory. But of course, all that is beautiful in science need not also be practical. And surely, not all that is practical in science is beautiful. Here we have both. With all their complexity, the models of finance theory have nevertheless had a direct and significant influence on finance practice. Today, much of the applied financial research on the use of sophisticated mathematical models takes place within financial institutions. Although not unique, this conjoining of intrinsic intellectual interest with extrinsic application is a prevailing theme of both research and teaching in modern finance. Perhaps no institution in France better exemplifies this theme than HSA, with its balanced and integrated focus on first-rank theoretical research and first-rank preparation for management practice. With its origins in the 19th century, the founding of the Professorial College at HSA 25 years ago coincided with the early formulation of the mathematical models that transformed finance practice. It would thus seem natural on this occasion to trace the subsequent development of finance practice from then and until now. Happily, however, a number of such retrospectives are in print. I therefore move directly to finance issues of the present and most importantly, the impending future. I begin with the question, why is there today such an intensity of concern among managers, regulators, politicians, the press, and the public and indeed academicians over the very new activities and risks of financial institutions relative to their traditional risks such as commercial and real estate loans or less developed countries debt. The past quarter century has seen not only revolutionary changes in the world's financial markets and institutions but also vast improvements in our understanding of how to use them to provide new investment opportunities and ways of managing risk. Those financial innovations came about in part through a wide array of new security designs, in part through advances in computer and telecommunications technology, and in part through important advances in the theory of finance. Now, of course, one need do no more than utter the words, Mattel Gesellschaft, or Procter and Gamble, to make the point that these innovations have had a dysfunctional impact in some individual cases. However, there has not yet been 
a major financial crisis associated with these new activities and instruments of the kind associated with defaults by LDC countries and the U.S. savings and loans institutions in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, one conjecture about the source of this collective anxiety on the risks of the new activities holds that their implementation has required a major changes in the basic institutional hierarchy and in the infrastructure to support it. As a result, the knowledge base required to manage this part of the system differs significantly from the traditional training and experience of many private sector financial managers as well as regulators. Changes of this sort are threatening. It is difficult to deal with change that is exogenous with respect to our tradi traditional knowledge base and framework, and therefore comes to seem beyond our control. Less understanding of the new environment can create a sense of greater risk, even when the objective level of risk in the system is unchanged or actually reduced. Much the same point can be made about households, the ultimate consumers of financial services. One major institutional change over the last 15 years or so has been the disaggregation of financial services, especially at the retail level. Another has been deregulation, combined by necessity with a reduction in government guarantees of financial performance. These changes cast significantly more individual responsibility for risk bearing directly onto the household. In the United States, for example, the fully government guaranteed bank deposit with an interest rate set by regulation, which was once virtually the only form of liquid short-term asset holding of households, now shares significant space with a variety of substitutes such as money funds, which are not guaranteed with respect to payment interest rate, or liquidity. Where once Social Security and defined benefit corporate pension plans assured households of a no-thought provision for retirement, there is now a major shift towards defined contribution plans, pension plans, in which the amounts available at retirement depend exclusively on the returns earned on invested funds during the work years. In all of this, the household bears the responsibility for the allocation of funds among investment alternatives. Even residential mortgages, which have always been set at a fixed rate in the United States, have now shifted toward variable rates, which subject the household to direct interest rate risk exposure. Thus, like financial managers and regulators, households are now called upon to make important financial decisions involving risk that they had not had to make in the past and may not be trained to make in the present. In this sense, the evolving structure of the financial system has a dysfunctional aspect. However, examined from the perspective of physiology rather than pathology, financial innovation can be perceived as the force driving the global financial system toward a goal of greater economic efficiency. Innovations in financial contracting technology can particularly improve efficiency by expanding opportunities for risk sharing, helping to complete markets, lowering transaction costs, and reducing information and agency costs. Derivative securities provide a prime example. Some observers see the extraordinary growth in the use of derivative securities over the past five years as little more than a fad. But a more likely explanation for the large increase in volume 
is the vast savings in transactions costs derived from their use. The costs of implementing financial strategies for institutions using derivatives can be a tenth or a twentieth of the cost of using the underlying cash market securities. Further improved technology, together with growing breadth and experience in the application of derivatives, will reduce transaction costs securely as both users and producers of derivatives move down the learning curve. With such prospective cost savings, we can see derivatives as a permanent part of the mainstream global financial system. Derivative securities have provided effective instruments for controlling systematic risk exposures to interest rates, currencies, commodities, and equity markets. Financial engineering, employing derivatives and special purpose institutional structures, has helped link individual, individual national financial systems into a global system for capital and risk transfers. These efficient adapters allow both corporations and sovereigns to tap global capital markets for financing by providing a smooth transition across currencies and across often widely different regulations, tax rules, and institutional practices in those national systems. After all, it is still rather early in the development and implementation of financial contracting technology. As producers and consumers gain experience and move down the learning curve, derivative securities will probably become more customized and the user base for such contracts will broaden significantly. Financial contracting solutions for implementing corporate strategies will compete with physical ones. For example, consider an energy company that has crude oil properties and gas stations. And as suppose further that as a result of a strategic analysis, it was decided that the corporation should integrate, integrate from crude oil through its final product distribution and gas stations. The missing link, of course, is the refining, the process of transforming the crude oil into the finished product. Now, in the past, implementing that strategy would have required either the building or the buying of an existing refinery, a physical solution. Today, and as we move into the future, an alternative solution may be the synthetic refinery produced entirely by contracting technology. Simple illustration is the institution or the corporation enters into a series of contracts in which it agrees to deliver certain quantities of crude oil at a certain time in certain place and in return receives at some delayed date a mix of gasoline and heating oil products available for distribution. Again, all contractual arrangements. Although contractual, functionally this is a refinery. Delivered our crude oil at one date, received our refined products at another. For many institutional corporations, getting into the refining area in this example with no or little experience in managing such activities would be a very costly and difficult implementation of the strategy. The success of such contracting alternatives will depend much on finding effective structures for ensuring contracts performance, including clarification of the standing of such agreements in bankruptcy. A consequence of all of this is the need for greater understanding of risk management by users, producers, and regulators of financial contracts. Furthermore, improvements in efficiency from derivative products 
cannot be effectively realized without concurrent changes in the financial infrastructure. That is, the institutional interfaces between intermediaries and financial markets, regulatory practices, organization of trading, clearing, and other back office facilities, and management information systems. When treated atomistically, innovations in financial products can be implemented unilaterally and rather quickly. In contrast, changes in financial infrastructure must be more, I, I apologize, must be more coordinated and therefore take longer to implement. For example, it is not surprising that revisions in accounting standards used in external risk monitoring and implementation of regulations often do not keep pace with derivative product innovations. It is possible that the cumulative imbalance between product and infrastructural development could at the extreme even become large enough to jeopardize the very functioning of the system. Hence the need for government policy to protect against such breakdown, even if the likelihood of such a systemic event is quite small. But a single-minded policy focused exclusively on systemic risk concerns could derail the engine of innovation and bring to halt the financial system's movement to greater efficiency. Now, much has been written by government agencies and supervisory bodies of financial institutions about the essential role of risk management and control by both producers and users of modern financial technology. A prime issue is the development of effective means for measuring risk exposures that are created or reduced by the use of derivatives. It is especially important to have measurement of the system, systemic risk exposure of derivatives evaluated in comparison to the risk exposure of the alternative financial structure that they replace, and not evaluated, as is often the case, in abstract, absolute terms, as if there was no systemic risk exposure prior to their introduction. Only in this way can, we, can one assess whether specific innovations are sources of stability or instability. Financial accounting must undergo fundamental revisions to facilitate the measurement of risk. Current practices are focused on valuation, which it must be remembered is inherently a static measure of financial condition. Contractual agreements such as swaps, futures, and other derivatives do not appear on firms' balance sheets primarily because they initially have no value. Hence, the traditional accounting approach has no place for them. Although such derivatives at least initially have zero value, they significantly alter the risk characteristics of the firm's liabilities, which do have value and are therefore carried on the balance sheet. To capture these shifts in risk, the accounting system simply must expand to report exposures to changes in the levels and volatilities of interest rates, currencies, commodity prices, and equity prices. This new risk accounting approach, with its focus on exposures to changes, is inherently a dynamic measure of financial condition, inasmuch as it indicates how the individual balance sheet values are likely to change in response to changes in the financial and economic environment. Effective risk management, especially for derivatives, is possible only with a risk accounting system. Risk management and supervisory systems, whether internal managerial or external regulatory, that focus on institutional or product classifications instead of functional classifications by exposures are entirely inadequate. Only consider the number of ways for taking a levered position 
in the U.S. equity market. Single activity, a levered position in the U.S. equity market. One could do so by buying on margin in the cash stock market. One could invest in a uh, equity index fund and borrow from a bank to finance it. One can go long a futures contract. You can go long an over-the-counter forward contract. You can enter into a swap agreement to receive the total return on the U.S. stock market and pay LIBOR. You can go long in exchange-traded calls and short puts on the U.S. stock market. You can go long OTC calls and puts on the U.S. stock market. Through repurchase agreements, you can finance a purchase of an equity-linked note whose interest payments depend on what happens to the U.S. stock market. You can purchase a certificate of deposit from a bank where the returns or the interest on that deposit are linked to the returns on the U.S. stock market. You can either buy on margin or purchase the capital appreciation component of unit investment trusts, which hold the U.S. stock market. And you could borrow to buy a variable rate annuity contract whose return is linked to the U.S. stock market. Now, I know you haven't been keeping count. But these are just 11 ways of achieving the equivalent economic exposure of a levered position in the U.S. stock market. And no doubt the list could be enlarged by those of you out there. But no matter. To provide effective oversight, the system of analysis used by the internal risk manager must capture and aggregate the common exposures of different products and instruments. And the same point applies to the external supervisor who will find it increasingly more difficult to regulate along traditional institutional lines. In the United States alone, the types of institutions in these 11 functionally equivalent transactions include brokers, mutual funds, investment banks, commercial banks, insurance companies, and exchanges. And currently, the regulatory authorities involved include the Federal Reserve, controller of the currency, SEC, CFTC, and various state insurance commissions. Now, it should be noted, moreover, that the 11 different forms for investing in the U.S. stock market are not simply cosmetic product differentiations among competing issuers' institutions. Because of different tax and regulatory structures, and other institutional rigidities, customers do not treat them as perfect substitutes. More generally, the flexibility created by the widespread use of contractual agreements, other derivatives, and specialized institutional designs is essential for globalization of the financial system. As we all know, the financial systems of individual nation states are rarely com compatible in institutional forms, regulations, and practices. And as already noted, contractual agreements are efficient means for creating interfaces among those systems. And for that reason, development of the contracting technology and derivative security markets within smaller and emerging market countries can provide a gateway for their access to world capital markets. In sum, the increasing flexibility and global mobility of financial institutions, together with an expanding derivatives technology for creating custom financial services at low cost, have far-reaching implications for the future regulation of financial services and national stabilization policies. The essential point is that effective regulation will have to shift from an institutional framework to a functional framework in which economically equivalent transactions are treated the same. The implementation of such comprehensive regulation will constitute a major challenge. The recent proposal for global capital requirements on marketable securities put forth by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision is an encouraging step in that direction. More generally, central bank and public finance policymakers 
are likely to find it increasingly necessary to understand risk management and financial engineering. This expertise is needed not just to permit informed supervision of private sector financial activities, but also to perform central bank monetary and stabilization functions more effectively. Those who provide internal and supervisory oversight of financial risk face challenges and problems that have probably never been as complex. But the technological and human resources available to find solutions to those problems have surely never been greater. Thank you. Please visit us at www.agc.edu.